Are there serial killers in Antarctica? Who was the worst in Europe? Africa had more than you might think, and killers in South America smash records. As for North America, we struggled to pick out one person, but we got there in the end. Let's start with Oceania, the far-flung continent of the world that contains Australasia, Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. In terms of population, Oceania is small, with only about 44.4 million people living in it. That doesn't mean the continent doesn't have its fair share of barbaric and twisted killers. Something we need to get straight at the beginning of the show is what defines a serial killer. This meaning has changed over time, but according to the FBI website, it's the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offenders in separate events. This is not the same as a spree killer, even if the spree killers murder many people. To meet the definition of a serial killer, there has to be a cooling off period between the crimes. One more thing we'll tell you before we go down this blood-spattered rabbit hole today is where the term serial killer came from. As you might know, centuries ago, such crimes were thought to be so abhorrent that they were sometimes blamed on werewolves or vampires or some kind of evil spirit. Later we heard the term lust killer because many of these crimes involved a sexual element. A German criminologist wrote in the 1930s about Serienmörder or serial murder, and the term also appeared in the 1966 book by a British author, The Meaning of Murder. In the 1970s, Robert Ressler, famous for his starring role at the FBI's then new behavioral science unit, think Silence of the Lambs, used the term when he was giving a lecture at a British police academy. This is when profiling was becoming all the rage. The New York Times used the term an estimated 233 times in the 1980s, and in the 1990s an estimated 2,514 times. The rest is history. The term serial killer became planted in our minds. But what's fascinating is the media and the movie industry only ever seemed to pick on a few of them while not reporting or representing some of the very worst. Today we hope to shed some light on some of those people. Over the years we've researched many killers, so we think we're in a good position to tell you which ones were the most terrifying. Bear in mind that this show is indeed about the most terrifying, not the most prolific or most famous. We're talking about the scariest, the ones who give you nightmares, whose vicious acts leave you both paralyzed with fear and perplexed as to what can go wrong with the human psyche. Oceania for Oceania, we could have written about the sorcery murders in Papua New Guinea, also known as witchcraft killings, in which entire families were hacked apart just recently after being accused of witchcraft. Then in the same country, there was Stephen Garasai Tari, aka Black Jesus, a pastor and a cult leader accused in the 2000s of murder and cannibalism. But we've chosen Australia for our winning nation in regard to terrifying serial killers, the country that has spawned countless Outback movies in which Australian hicks terrorize backpackers. Such stories are based on the serial killer Ivan Milat, who in the late 80s and early 90s abducted backpackers, hitchhikers, and killed at least seven. His crimes were indeed terrifying. He tied his victims up and in some cases paralyzed them by stabbing them in the spine, further prolonging their torture. In technical terms, he was a hedonistic killer, doing it for pleasure, not as part of some kind of mission, for example, the fictional Dexter, or because he wanted to be with the dead bodies, like lust killers Jeffrey Dahmer and Dennis Nilsson. Since he kept his victims alive and dominated them, he also likely fell into the category of a power control killer. He obviously enjoyed seeing people in pain, so we can say he was a sadistic thrill killer. It's the sadistic thrill killers and also the lust killers that usually scare us the most. This now brings us to Oceania's most terrifying killer, a sadist if there ever was one, but not a lust killer. His name was John Bunting. His crimes took place between August 1992 and May 1999, in and close to the city of Adelaide, South Australia. We guess a few of you might already know his name due to a very realistic movie of the murders titled The Snowtown Murders, a film that is so brilliantly wretched and disturbing it'll make you feel like having the longest shower of your life after watching it. The crimes were so nasty that three of the original 15 jurors involved in the trial asked to be removed from the case. They just couldn't handle it. To this day, journalists and jurors receive counseling. John Bunting traumatized an entire nation. Bunting was born on September 4, 1966, in a small town in the state of Queensland. To understand what shaped the man to come, we need to look no further than his childhood, when at the age of eight he was beaten by the older brother of one of his friends. This older kid then sexually abused him. 
According to an academic paper on bunting, when he was young he didn't wet the bed or start fires everywhere, but he did torture animals. These are three of the most common behaviors noticed in the childhood of future serial killers. He tortured ants with acid and later that escalated to killing and skinning cats and dogs. It's said he had an unhealthy interest in anatomy. At age 20, he found the perfect job at a crematorium, and when dead bodies weren't enough, he found work slaughtering animals at the company S.A. Meat Corporation. Unlike most people, he told friends he took a great pleasure in this line of work. Bunting needed to kill, but it seemed he needed a reason to kill. His reason would be allegations of sexual misconduct, allegations he created all by himself. On August 31, 1992, he took a shovel and beat to death 20-year-old Clinton Douglas Trezise. Bunting later told his friends and accomplices that Trezise had harmed children. That was likely not true, but Bunting was never interested in the facts. He just wanted to kill. When Bunting got rid of the body, he employed the help of a man named Robert Wagner and a 40-year-old pre-op transgender woman, Vanessa Lane, who'd also lived under the name of Barry Lane. Lane and Wagner were in an intimate relationship at this point, but not for long. After Bunting married a woman named Elizabeth Harvey, the mother of a young, not-so-smart boy named Jamie Vlasakis, he became the boy's father figure. Notably, one day Vlasakis told Bunting that when he was 13, his much larger stepbrother, Troy Yude, had violated him. So you can probably imagine what Bunting thought about this. Bunting told him that very soon Yud would get what was coming to him. Vlasakis soon discovered that Bunting had killed and intended to kill again. In fact, Vlasakis' mom had already helped Bunting with one murder, that of the 26-year-old Ray Allen Peter Davies. Davies, who had a very low IQ, was accused of hurting young men. On Christmas 1995, Elizabeth Harvey stabbed him in the leg, and then he was choked unconscious by Wagner. They took Davies to another house where they proceeded to electrocute him with jumper cables and beat him so hard in the genital area that he passed out and died. Bunting now had a taste for torture. He loved it. Wagner loved it. To hurt someone like that and see the life drain from them, it was exhilarating for this group of sadistic killers. On the wall of the room in the house, Bunting had a rock spider wall in which the names of various people were connected with string. Bunting told Vlasakis that these men were all guilty of hurting boys or at least of sleeping with other men. Each one of them, said Bunting, had to go. After two more murders, they killed Wagner's partner, Lane. Well, ex-partner. The two had already split up. Bunting had never liked Lane. He put up with her only because Lane was familiar with sexual predators in the area, and she occasionally gave names to Bunting. They tortured her in a bathtub, crushing her toes with pliers, beating her head, and strangling her with a cord, after which she finally died but not before she'd given up her bank details. While Bunting was a compulsive killer, he also made money from his morbid ventures by taking people's IDs, bank details, and cards. Later, Bunting and his accomplices hanged an 18-year-old paranoid schizophrenic man from a tree. In such a depressed and impoverished area, police didn't even bother to investigate the murder thoroughly. Soon after, Bunting was pricked by a needle left lying on a couch by a substance abuser. He strangled him for that. Then they got Troy Yud, who was then 21. He might have been Vlasakis' half-brother, but after what Vlasakis had accused him of, Bunting was intent on causing him the utmost harm. They tortured him, crushing his toes, and forced him to say that he was going away for a while on recording. As things tend to happen in the killing world, the violence escalated. Bunting would choose names from his spider wall, people who were no doubt innocent of whatever he'd accused them of, and abducted them after gaining their trust. They took 18-year-old Frederick Fred Robert Brooks and put him in handcuffs and thumb cuffs. They tortured him for hours, shoving things inside of him, injecting bleach into his life-giving organs, and shocking the same place with electricity. Again, before they got what they wanted, they crushed his toes with pliers, now a trademark of their torture. Their last victim, 24-year-old David Johnson, was not even accused of a crime. Bunting was homophobic. He hated men he'd accused of touching people they shouldn't touch. He even hated overweight people, who he called a waste of space. But with Johnson, he had no reason to feel such hate. He soon made one up, though. Bunting said Johnson was too tidy. He called him a yuppie, too posh, accused him of looking down on the rest of them. While Bunting and his view had already dumped bodies in the small town of Snowtown, Johnson was the only victim actually killed in Snowtown. Another first with Johnson was that Bunting and Wagner cut off his flesh, fried it, and ate it. They were now cannibals. It was there in Snowtown where police later found eight victims inside six barrels, or what was left of them. It was discovered that a man named Mark Ray Hayden had been helping Bunting dispose of the bodies. One of the victims was actually Hayden's wife, Elizabeth, whom Bunting had tortured and killed, as usual, with songs blasting over the screams. 
Bunting particularly liked the US band Live's album Throwing Copper, which he played while torturing his victims, making them call him God, Master, and Lord Sir. Due to this discovery, the case became known as the Bodies in the Barrels murder. The Guardian reported on Wednesday, December 13, 2000, Bodies in Barrels case grips Australia. The article stated the court heard how handcuffs, knives, rubber gloves, and a machine capable of giving electric shocks were unearthed in the vault alongside the bodies. A pathologist said about the bodies, there was cutting, quite a bit of cutting. The number of pieces the legs were reduced to show quite a deal of work in getting flesh off the bones. In court, Vlasakis wept and one time even vomited. He was given four consecutive life sentences for his parts in the crimes, compared to Wagner's 10 life sentences and Bunting's 11 life sentences. Wagner, who was illiterate, said in court he did what he'd done because people were doing terrible things to children. He added the authorities didn't do anything about it. I decided to take action. I took that action. Thank you. He failed to mention if these people were guilty or not, and he didn't mention that he'd obviously enjoyed torturing them. The judge in response told him, I am satisfied both of you derived pleasure from the physical act of killing and the violence and torture that preceded some of the killings. I'm also satisfied that you derived pleasure from the defleshing and dismembering of some of the bodies. The court heard how Wagner and Bunting enjoyed the dismembering part, the skinning part, sometimes taking the head of a victim, and inviting each other to kiss the puppet. Now, let's go to Africa, to a country whose number one serial killer was so bad the police enlisted the help of the serial killer expert we mentioned earlier, Robert Ressler. Africa. Like with other continents, there was no easy choice when picking an African serial killer. We thought about Namibia's so-called B1 Butcher, who with precision dismembered at least five people between 2005 and 2007 and dumped their bodies along the country's B1 National Highway. There have been arrests in the past, but it seems the B1 Butcher may still be on the loose. Then there was Haj Mohammed Masvewi, Morocco's most infamous shoemaker who, in the early 1900s, would invite women into his shop, drug them, and then mutilate and behead them. But we've chosen a man named Moses Sittel, aka the South African Strangler, sometimes referred to as the Ted Bundy of Africa. He was born on November 17, 1964, in a town in Gauteng, in the smallest but wealthiest province in South Africa. Wealthiest because about a quarter of South Africa's population lives there, many of whom are residents of the country's largest city, Johannesburg. Satol's life was certainly not one of riches. His father Simon died young, and his mother Sophie had very little money during his early years in the rough and ready township of Vosloris. Since Moses' mother was unable to take care of him and his four other siblings, they were one day dumped at a police station. Her parting message to them all was, please don't give them my name. After that came the orphanage, where the adult systematically mistreated Moses. He tried to run away on several occasions, once going to live with his brother Patrick. From there, he earned a tough living in the province's gold mines, sometimes doing other odd jobs, often walking the streets helping homeless kids. He might have had a soft spot for such children, but he certainly harbored a lot of anger toward women. It seems he could never forgive his mother, the way she told him as a scared little boy, please don't give them my name. He despised women. And like Mr. Bundy, Sittel had the gift of gab. He was strong, handsome, and very charming. Witnesses to his case would later come forward and express just how well he spoke, how clever he was, and how he was able to gain the trust of just about anyone. It helped, of course, that women often saw him helping kids in the streets. In 1994, his murder spree began. His method of luring victims was perhaps quite novel. He'd approach women in the street and tell them he was managing an NGO that takes care of children called Youth Against Human Abuse. It looked legit. He had documents. While working at a car wash, Siddle had asked a typist named Melody to type up all those documents. His charm certainly helped. So when he told women he had job openings, they believed him. A witness later explained how he approached one of his victims. He promised her a job, a better job, and money and benefits. He gave her forms for a job. She trusted him because she was excited. She said, I'm not coming to work tomorrow because this man is taking me on a date to Johannesburg to have some lunch. He wasn't. The only place youth against human abuse existed was in Siddle's head. That woman who'd been excited about the new job never returned home. Her family became frantic only to become shocked when a few weeks later, her mutilated body was found in a field. Later, more bodies were found. They soon stacked up. Cops couldn't keep up with it, especially as the bodies were discovered with no IDs on them. As time went on, the police noticed that the killer was becoming more confident. He spent more time with the bodies. He hurt the women in more creative ways. A newspaper explained, The killer was evolving his murder technique to extract the greatest pain from his victims, assumingly increasing his own pleasure. 
In fact, the bodies piled up so fast that police felt the need to contact Robert Ressler, the FBI profiler and serial killer expert over in the USA. As many as 30 bodies were found in a matter of a few months, President Nelson Mandela had to cancel trips abroad. South Africa was in a state of panic. Matters were made more chaotic when bodies were found with words written on their skin. On one body, Siddle wrote in broken English, She is a beach. I am no fighting with you, please. And we must stay here for as long as you don't understand. Were these messages for the cops? In 1995, police discovered that Sithole had been seen with one of the victims, and with his name already on file for a violent sexual crime, they went after him, only for Sithole to go on the run. That's when he called a journalist at the Star newspaper called Tamsin De Beer. He said he was the killer calling himself Joseph Maguena. In a phone interview, he admitted to scores of murders, but denied he had anything to do with the murder of a woman and her two-year-old son. In fact, he had killed the boy, hitting him over the head after which the kid died in the field from exposure. In a third call, cops tracked the number. It was a payphone, but by the time they got there, Sithole was gone. Police discovered that this Mr. Maguina was actually Moses Sithole, having tracked a number he'd given to some of his victims in the interview process. There was nowhere to run now. Sithole later got in touch with his brother-in-law and asked for a gun. When he met with his brother-in-law, who'd already told the cops, they swooped in on him. The cops shot him twice, once in the abdomen and once in the leg, when he charged at them with an axe. Sithole spent two days in critical condition, after which he was interviewed. What's disturbing is that some reports say that while he was admitting to murdering those women, under the sheets he was playing with himself. That was one sick man. He explained to the investigators why he committed those heinous crimes, saying, I force a woman to go where I want, and when I go there I tell them, do you know what? I was hurt, so I'm doing it now. Then I kill them. So, he blamed his childhood maltreatment for his depravity. He admitted to killing 29 women in the space of just over one year, making him arguably the most prolific African serial killer in terms of body count and the short time frame the murders were committed in. Police say they had him on 38 murders, which would mean around 3 murders a month. He was actually suspected of murdering 79 women, which if true would make him about the busiest serial killer in African history. 79 in one year is a lot. But as you'll see later, others have killed in a similar quick fashion. In subsequent interviews, Siddhole said he took great pleasure from watching the women's eyes bulge when he strangled them, often with their own underwear. The full extent of how he tortured his victims was never detailed, but it was written that he put them through absolute horror and agony. A South African newspaper wrote, The case of Moses Sithole serves as a painful reminder of the existence of evil in our society. This man was hated all over South Africa, and it came as no surprise when on December 4, 1997, he was sentenced to 2,410 years in prison with no possibility of parole for 930 years. He's still in prison today at the Mangawung Correctional Center at Bloemfontein, South Africa's so-called judicial capital. Let's now move to Asia, the largest continent in the world, home to around 4.7 billion people. Asia. With a population that large, it's not easy to choose one serial killer. We might have gone for Ahmad Suraji, the Indonesian killer of 42 women and girls who believed that their deaths would give him supernatural abilities. In terms of evil geniuses, the Vietnamese French psycho scammer Charles Sobraj had a story like no other, which included drugging and murdering backpackers in Bangkok and devising some of the most exceptional prison escapes in world history. In Japan, there was Sutomu Miyazaki, the killer of young girls who mutilated their bodies and committed unspeakable acts with the corpses. Then there was the butcher of Rostov in Russia, Andrei Chikatilo, who brutally murdered over 50 women from 1978 to 1990. And when we say brutal, we mean it with a capital B. During his confession in 1982, he admitted that the cries, the blood, and the agony gave him relaxation and a certain pleasure. So-called lust killers, killers who mutilate, stab, and dismember solely for sexual gratification, are scary especially when some of them like to do all of this while the men or women are alive. Then again, doing things with dead bodies or body parts is equally disgusting and exceedingly baffling. You'll learn more about this later in the show, but first, we need to tell you about our number one pick from Asia, a case that Japanese cops said was unprecedented in the history of the nation. The Japanese media at the time said that they wouldn't print the details of the case since they were too disturbing for human consumption. There were actually two killers. Futoshi Matsunaga was born in the city of Kita Kyushu on April 28, 1961, and his accomplice, Junko Ogata, 
was born in the city of Kureme on February 25, 1962. The two who studied together in school in the Fukuoka prefecture were both from well-off families, especially Ogata, whose family had money from land. They were both smart, they were both good-looking, and they showed none of the signs normally seen in the childhood of a serial killer. Matsunaga was something of a playboy in school. He became a father at age 19, at which point he already had a slew of mistresses. And that's when he met his old school pal Ogata, who soon got into a relationship with Matsunaga despite his marriage. This is why Ogata's mother, Shizumi, told her daughter to stay away from him. The Japanese press doesn't give many details, but it was said that Matsunaga at one point engaged in sexual misconduct with Shizumi and later persuaded Junko to move in with him. By this point, he'd already divorced his first wife. This was not a nice man. He enjoyed wrecking families. He was chaos walking, feeding from other people's misery. Ogata, who was mentally unstable at times and suffered from depression, was a victim too in these early days completely under the spell of her deranged lover. There's good reason that he became known as the mind control killer, but that doesn't mean we can forgive Ogata for what happened next. Still, reports say he beat her, he branded her with cigarettes, and using a safety pin and Indian ink forced her to tattoo his name on her thigh. Matsunaga ticked all the boxes for a psychopath. He was controlling, he showed no empathy, he oozed superficial charm, lied a lot, became bored easily, and had a grandiose sense of self-worth. He was impulsive, parasitic, shallow, a cheat, and showed no remorse or guilt for his actions. But there are psychopaths everywhere. It's often said about 1% of the human population meets the criteria for a psychopath, and the vast majority of them don't kill people for money and pleasure. On the outside, this charming fella looked successful. He owned a futon firm he named World and seemed to be doing okay. Little did people know that one way he had fun at work was by getting his five or six employees into the soundproof room above the shop and giving them electric shocks. This was 1980s Japan, where folks were generally expected to respect their boss. The Japanese media later reported, translated to English, employees were called there if they were unable to meet their monthly sales quota or if Matsunaga was in a bad mood. A senior employee held him down and wrapped electrical cords with exposed metal around his hands and ankles. One of those employees, who with the other employees lived behind the futon business in a small wooden house, said years later it was a hellish life working for Matsunaga. He explained to the press what the shocks felt like, saying, It was as if my brain had been hit with an iron rod. I lost consciousness for a moment, but I always woke up with burning pain in my limbs. At the time, Matsunaga told his employees, men he locked in that wooden house, that he knew they had parents and sisters and if they ever squealed, they would be killed. Those employees had no idea their boss had stolen 180 million yen, about $2.2 million, as part of fraud and blackmail schemes. His scheme fell apart when the cops started investigating him, only for him and Ogata to go on the run. Both of them were then added to Japan's most wanted list in 1992. This is where things turn much darker. While on the run, Matsunaga met a woman he'd known in the past who was married with three kids. She immediately fell for the charming Matsunaga and agreed to leave her husband. He told her, divorce him and come to me, and I'll take care of your children. At this point, he already had a kid with Ogata, but he told the woman that Ogata was his sister and the kid was his niece. In September 1993, one of the women's children mysteriously dropped dead. She mysteriously died a year later, but not before Matsunaga had defrauded her family of 11.8 million yen, or about 145,000 US dollars. The police have never been able to convict him of these deaths, but it's thought he was the perpetrator. In 1994, he met an estate agent named Kumio Toratani, who was living with his 10-year-old daughter. The two talked about crimes they committed in the past. At that time, Ogata told Kumio she had experience in childcare and would take care of his daughter. What happened next was just plain weird, but maybe that's because of cultural differences between Japan and the West. We should also understand that Matsunaga told Kumio that he wanted to start a business with him, but only if he could completely trust him. The Japanese press reported that on one of Matsunaga and Kumio's drinking nights, Matsunaga pulled out a form and told Kumio he'd have to sign it to prove he wasn't lying about his criminal past. The form was titled Certificate of Facts. Below was written, I certify that I committed the crime of, and below that a space to write a signature. Kumio signed it, apparently under great pressure, after which Matsunaga blackmailed him. This is when Matsunaga and Ogata took Kumio and his daughter hostage in their own home. They demanded money, saying the two couldn't leave until the ransom was paid. Kumio was then tied up, or as the Japanese press put it, lynched. After being forced into a stress position, Matsunaga would electrocute him if he moved. He was fed little to no food, sometimes being fed his own feces and vomit. 
they even forced his daughter to bite him all over his body. You could only imagine how distressing this was for the girl. Kumio died soon after and Matsunaga managed to convince the daughter it was her fault. He told her, I couldn't take your father to the hospital because of the impression you made on him with your teeth. If I took him to the hospital, they'd immediately know that you killed him and the police would arrest him. She believed him, she was just a kid. The Japanese press explained, Matsunaga left the disposal of the corpse to Junko and the girl. The two dismembered the bodies using knives, saws, and blenders, boiled them in pots, threw the chunks into the ocean, and disposed of the meat juices in public toilets. He then got the daughter to sign on one of the certificates that said, I certify that I killed my biological father with murderous intent. He then met a woman who worked for Kumio. As usual, he convinced her he was in love with her, telling her he was a professor at Kyoto University. She and her daughter moved in with Matsunaga, after which they were held prisoner, electrocuted, starved, and beaten as she was forced to borrow money from all of her relatives. One day, she managed to get free after jumping through a second floor window, sustaining a broken hip and a crushed lung. It's uncertain how much she suffered as a result, but when found, she was committed to a mental institution. After this failed extortion and murder attempt, Junko Ogata would get extra money from her parents and relatives, the other Ogatas, but it was never enough. In 1997, she went to work in a hostess bar and one day, she just never returned home. At this point, she lived in a busy house with her own kids and the daughter they would kidnapped. Matsunaga knew she would have gone to her parents, so he called them. They arranged to meet him in his apartment. Junko's mother, Shizumi, her father, Omare, Junko's sister, Raiko, and her husband, Kazuya, all went, as did Raiko and Kazuya's two children, Aya and Yuki. Big mistake. The Japanese press said that once again he used his mind control to keep them there. Junko turned up later knowing he had her family. As soon as she stepped through the door, she was lynched and electrocuted. But get this, he convinced her family that it was Junko who was in the wrong, and so she deserved it. A Japanese news report stated, At this point, Junko was more shocked that her family not only took Matsunaga's side, but also that they were placed under his wing rather than being deceived. As time went on, Matsunaga convinced Raiko and Kazuya that Shizumi had gone mad, telling them they needed to strangle her. The story gets confusing here. A lot of money was talked about, and it seems Matsunaga managed to convince family members that they had enemies within their own family. He made them hate and distrust each other, all living in this little apartment. It was about to become the home of a bloodbath. If this sounds unbelievable to you, it does to us too, but we guess there's a reason he was named the Mind Control Killer. He was apparently excellent at that job. In December 1997, he convinced Junko to electrocute her own father, Omare, to death. He forced the remaining members of the Yagata family to cut up the corpse and dispose of it. In January, he convinced Kazuya to strangle his wife, Raiko, and their 10-year-old daughter, Aya. He killed his wife, but not the daughter. Aya would succumb to depravity soon enough, though. Matsunaga then took Kazuya to a bathroom, where he eventually died from starvation on April 13, 1998. Soon after, Matsunaga convinced Junko to kill Raiko's five-year-old son, Yuki. Talk about a house of horrors. Both her and Junko then tortured Aya. It was Kumio's daughter, who'd been with them all this time, that finally murdered Aya, but under duress. The date was June 7, 1998. Now, the only survivors were Junko's own children. Matsunaga told Junko, because you ran away that time, I had no choice but to kill your entire family. It's your fault. On January 30, 2002, Kumio's daughter managed to escape, but Matsunaga found her, took her back to her apartment and tied her up and electrocuted her. She escaped again in March and this time managed to get to the police. The daughters were taken into care. Everyone testified as to the extreme things they'd seen in that house, although the bodies were never found. Kumio explained how Matsunaga had made everyone hate each other. When he killed her father, he made a stew with the body parts and forced her to eat some. She said he was absolutely inhuman. A neighbor later testified in court, perhaps having smelled the ingredients of that stew, stated, There was this vile smell that permeated the entire apartment block. People couldn't believe what they were hearing, and in actuality, they only heard the lighter version of the story. In 2005, both Matsunaga and Junko were sentenced to death, but in 2007, Junko's sentence was commuted to life in prison. Just about everyone in Japan said death is too good for these people. Amen to that. Could there be anyone as demented as Mr. Matsunaga? Maybe. Let's now visit Europe. Europe, the home of Jack the Ripper, the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, the extremely creepy and cruel couple Fred and Rose West, and the German man Karl Denke, aka the forgotten cannibal who butchered his 40-odd victims in the early 1900s and sold their meat as pork. 
Then there was Harold Shipman, the British doctor who might have put at least 215 of his patients to sleep forever, but his crimes don't elicit as much fear as other serial killer crimes do. Again, we have scores of people we could choose from going back centuries up to the present day, but the killer we think needs to join this list is Anatoly Onoprienko, the man often referred to as the Terminator or the Beast of Ukraine. By God, did he earn those very grim-sounding silver case. In March of 1996, the Ukrainian authorities were under pressure to solve a slew of cases in which people had been massacred in their homes and in the streets. The killer indeed went through them like a terminator. Out of desperation, the country's security services interrogated and tortured 26-year-old Yuri Mozola, thinking it was him. It wasn't, and the resulting torture ended up being fatal, adding the death of another innocent man to the case. Soon after, the now embarrassed and disgraced authorities received a tip-off. They were told the man they were looking for was Anatoly Onoprienko, a sadist of the highest order, a cruel maniac if there ever was one. There have been few serial killers in world history who were as violent as he was. In 1989, he walked into a house. He'd already scoped the place. He knew how many people lived there and was sure the house was far enough away from other houses that the screams wouldn't be noticed. He could have chosen a family of three or four or five, but in this case, he chose a home with a father, a mother, and eight children. He entered the home and, as planned, used a 12-gauge shotgun to blast the father. He then shot the mother, and one by one he followed the screaming kids around, blasting each one. Hence his nickname, The Terminator. It's hard to even imagine what that scene would have looked like, but he'd only just started. Months later, he saw a lot of car parked off the highway. Five people were sleeping inside. He blasted them all through the window before they could even realize what was going on. He later said, I just shot them. It's not that it gave me pleasure, but I felt this urge. From then on, it was almost like some game from outer space. He also said he was angry ever since growing up in an orphanage, leading to his thirst for wanting to cause harm to families. He also said he heard voices too, but that fact is still debated. That night, he got in the car with the dead family and took their valuables. Unlike some of the killers on this list, and especially one we'll talk about soon, he was not fond of dead bodies. He later admitted the stink would send out bad vibes. The smell was unbearable. A few months later, he massacred a family of four again with a shotgun. He then killed another family of four in their home and gunned down a man in the street who might have seen him leaving the house. In January 1996, he waited on the highway, gun in his jacket, and pulled people over, waving as if he was in distress. When they stopped, he gunned them down. One of the victims was a chef, one was a soldier, and another a taxi driver. Two weeks later, he broke into another home and massacred a family of five. When he left the house, he lit it on fire, only to be seen by a 27-year-old railroad worker and a 56-year-old pedestrian. He gunned both of them down. He did something similar 13 days later to another family, and around two weeks later, he shot a father and son. He then bashed the mother to death in front of the daughter with a hammer. When the daughter said she had no money, he took the hammer to her too. This man was a thrill killer, a sadist, what we generally call a violent maniac. There was no sexual motive, he was killing for the sake of killing. Albeit he took money and valuables from his victims, they'd have given him everything anyway, he just loved killing. Just over a week later, he engaged in what criminologists sometimes call overkill. He shot the parents, but with the kids he took his time, striking them over and over again with an axe. An hour later, he saw a man near the house, so he shot him to death and hacked up the body. He'd later tell cops he was just getting rid of the evidence, but there was certainly no need to kill every single person in those houses. He enjoyed it, no doubt about that. In an interview, he said one time after he killed the parents, he went to the bedroom where a girl was praying. She hadn't properly seen his face. She was just praying to God that she wouldn't be killed like her mom and pop. He told the investigator, seconds before I smashed her head, I ordered her to show me where they kept the money. She looked at me with an angry, defiant stare and said, no, I won't. That strength was incredible, but I felt nothing. He later called it hunting, explaining, I would be sitting bored with nothing to do and then suddenly this idea would get into my head. I would do everything to get it out of my mind, but I couldn't. It was stronger than me. This case is special because serial killers these days don't generally wipe out entire families. Sure, there were prolific axe murderers in the US at the start of the 20th century, but in the 21st century such massacres are rarely heard about. Had this crime been in the UK or the US, there'd already be seven TV shows made about it, and yet, we imagine most of you have never heard a thing about the Terminator. During the trial, his lawyers argued that he was mentally unfit to stand trial. Half the time, he'd ramble to them about being part of an experiment headed by the CIA and Interpol. It was a bit late for MKUltra. 
I'm not a maniac, he once said to an interviewer. If I were, I would have thrown myself into you and killed you right here. I've been taken over by a higher force. I'm like a rabbit in a laboratory, a part of an experiment to prove that man is capable of murdering and learning to live with his crimes. Other times he said such things as, I love all people, and I love those I killed. I looked those children I murdered in the eyes and I knew that it had to be done. For you it's 52 murders, but for me that's the norm. 52. That's the number of kills, except for the first two massacres. All of them happened in the space of about six months. Ukrainians were upset. It seemed to them the cops hadn't done enough, especially when they heard the killer say people screamed so loudly that they could be heard in neighboring villages. But nobody came to help them. Everybody went into hiding, like mice. He was given a death sentence, but after Ukraine abolished capital punishment, his sentence was commuted to life. Would he kill again if he were ever released? He once said, if I'm ever let out, I will start killing again, but this time it will be worse, ten times worse. The urge is there. Seize this chance because I am being groomed to serve Satan. After what I have learned out there, I have no competitors in my field. I will say that South America might say to that, hold my beer. Still, killing that many people in six months is certainly worthy of the record books. Now let's head over to South America, the continent that contains the most prolific serial killers in modern history. South America. Who to choose? We could go for the monster of the Andes, Pedro Lopez, a Colombian who killed at least 110 girls and women from 1969 to 1980 throughout South America. He claimed it was more like 300. Unbelievably, he was released from custody and is currently in hiding, believed to be out there killing again. In terms of raw numbers, the South Americans come out on top, especially when you consider another top 10 killer, Luis Alfredo Garavito aka The Beast, also from Colombia, who brutally tortured and murdered young men and boys, beating, cutting, slashing, biting, burning, and doing all manner of other unmentionable things to them as he had them bound. It's believed his body count was 221 from 1992 to 1999, so a higher number than the Terminators but within a much larger time frame. But we've chosen Daniel Carmargo Barbosa for this list, the so-called sadist of El Charquito. He was also from Colombia. We'll just add here, in case any Colombians are upset with us, that we had our eye on serial killers in Argentina, Brazil, and Peru. In the 1970s and 1980s, this sadistic creature murdered at least 72 girls and young women in Colombia and Ecuador. That's the lowest figure. He might well have murdered up to 180 girls. Like many or even most serial killers, Mr. Barbosa had a childhood befitting a nightmare. His cruel mother dressed him up as a girl and sent him to school where he was beaten up and humiliated. He wanted payback. He started off by drugging girls he persuaded to go to his apartment. You can imagine what he did next. In the early days, he let them go once they came around, but after one girl told the cops about her experience, he was imprisoned in 1964. From here on, he would not leave any more survivors. This guy was like the Pied Piper, the boogeyman luring young people to follow him, after which, the press reported, he would do his worst and then treated them to what they called an extremely brutal death, often in the middle of forests. He once said he chose the purest victims, the most innocent he could find, because he said they cried more, and he got off on the crying and the screaming. When his victims were young, he'd lure them with the promise of candy or another type of treat or snack. And when the victims were grown up, he'd use his intellect and cunning to get them to follow him. He was very successful at this. After he was caught, a Colombian journalist called him brilliant saying Barbosa talked about good and evil like a philosopher, often quoting the likes of Hermann Hesse, Sigmund Freud, Garcia Marquez, and Friedrich Nietzsche. He had an answer for everything and was able to speak of God and the devil equally, said the journalist. When Barbosa was finally caught in 1986, inside his briefcase was the book Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Like another killer we'll talk to you about soon, he obviously intellectualized murder. Barbosa admitted to killing 71 girls and women, but as we said, that number is likely much, much higher. We're not going to go through what happened to each victim, because it would be repetitive and just too grim, but we'll say police often found victims had been stamped to death, slashed, stabbed, strangled, and even crushed. His weapon of choice was often a machete. One time, an adult woman hit him on the head with a rock, so to make a point, he decapitated her and threw the head away like it was a piece of trash. With another victim, he cut out the lungs, heart, and kidneys, and then gutted her like a fish. Some serial killers, such as the Brit Dennis Nilsson or the American Jeffrey Dahmer, form an infinitely unhealthy relationship with the bodies, but for Barbosa, he wanted to show the utmost amount of disrespect, or at least he did that when they annoyed him. 
He even sometimes made nasty, taunting phone calls to the victims' families. His karma came knocking, but not until after he'd served his second prison sentence. After 10 years in prison in Colombia, he escaped, only for the authorities to announce that he would have been eaten in the shark-infested waters he entered. But that wasn't true. At this so-called Colombian Alcatraz, Barbosa had studied the ocean currents before he leaped into the water. He managed to get to Ecuador, where he carried on killing more than 50 times, only for two cops to get him minutes after he killed a girl in the capital city of Quito. Not only was he carrying that Dostoevsky book, but he was also carrying her bloodied clothes and a part of her sliced-off sexual organs. On November 13, 1994, at Quito's infamous Garcia Moreno prison, Carmago, his new celly, 29-year-old Giovanni Arcesio Noguera Jaramillo, forced him at knife point to kneel and said, it is the hour of vengeance. He stabbed him eight times and took an ear as a trophy. Noguera later told the guards that he was avenging the death of his aunt, one of the many victims of this sadist of El Charquito, Antarctica. Out there in the research stations, life can get pretty lonely, and people have been known to lose their minds somewhat. While there have been violent attacks in the past, we are yet to see an incident that could be turned into a movie like The Shining. Still, in 2018, media reported that one man had lost his mind due to a bit too much Antarctic desolation and cold. AP reported that a Russian researcher named Sergei Savitsky suffered an apparent emotional breakdown and stabbed a welder multiple times. The welder survived and Savitsky was sent back to Russia to undergo some mental checks. There have been a few cases of violence out there in the world's most remote wilderness, but as of yet, no serial killers. Well, not like this next continent, which has had quite a lot of them. North America if we look at data regarding the number of serial killers that have been documented in each country, the top 10 list looks a bit like this. Bear in mind, the FBI says there are around 25 to 50 serial killers working in the USA at any one time. United States, 3,204. England, 166. South Africa, 117. Canada, 106. Italy, 97. Japan, 96. Germany, 85. Australia, 81. India, 80. Russia, 73. The US might seem way ahead, but you also need to bear in mind that the US has been publishing information about serial killers for far longer than most other countries. Some countries that are somewhat closed off from the rest of the world, such as China and Russia, have no doubt suppressed information about their maniacs. You should also bear in mind the population of countries listed and the fact that some of these countries' police forces are much better at detecting killers, such as the US. Now, the US isn't as bad as the numbers suggest, but the country does seem to have quite a few serial killers. That might be because serial killers are so well reported that they become kinds of celebrities, and there's evidence that this can create copycats. In no other nation do killers get so much exposure. In the US, more often than not, they become famous. Okay, so who would be the worst in North America? We could, of course, have played it safe and chosen the psycho psycho Ted Bundy, but he doesn't frighten us like some of the others. Sure, Bundy's creepy, charming personality was petrifying, but we still think we need to look elsewhere. We could have chosen Ed Kemper, the high IQ, seemingly sweet man who slept with the decapitated heads of his victims, or Ed Gein, who doesn't have a high kill count but gets points for making skin suits from his victims that he actually wore and fashioning a belt made from nipples. Jeffrey Dahmer slept with the bodies and tried to create zombies as slaves by injecting chemicals into his drugged victims' heads. Oh, then you have the utterly depraved sadists, the toolbox killers, the quaint familiar freeway killer, and one of the scariest men in history who hardly ever gets a mention in the American press, Dean Coral, aka the Candyman, who horrifically tortured at least 28 boys on his torture wall in the early 70s after sometimes luring his victims with free candy. He fastened those teenagers to his infamous wall and used everything in his vile torture kit. After reading several books on North American serial killers, we'd say it was Coral's depravity that shocked us the most. The man was just insanely cruel. Even so, we're not choosing him. We decided on a sicko named Melvin Reese. One, because he deserves to be here, and two, because his story hasn't been as publicized as the rest of the killers we've mentioned. His nickname was the Sex Beast, which gives you a pretty good idea of what you're about to hear. His other nickname is perhaps more confusing. That was the Bebop Nietzsche Necrophile. Peter Vronsky, an author we've mentioned many times before who's done a lot of work on serial killers, introduced us to Reese in one of his books. A man Vronsky called a deeply twisted person with monstrous impulses. He was indeed monstrous. 
and yet he looked like a talented, intelligent, stable human being who you'd gladly invite over for dinner and be proud that he was the date of your daughter. He wasn't creepy or slimy like Bundy, or quiet like Kemper, or plain weird like Dahmer. This is one serial killer who, to everyone around him, was just a cool, friendly, and clever guy. For us, that makes him all the more terrifying. He could be your best buddy, your uncle, your teacher. We don't know much about his childhood, but we do know that in 1946 he joined the US Army and went to Europe, where he earned his bread as a military musician. On his return, he studied at the University of Maryland, where he proved he was an excellent musician, notably with a saxophone, piano, and clarinet. Jazz music was his biggest love, well, we guess after killing. After dropping out of uni, playing jazz in bars was how he made a living. Everything looked quite normal in his life. In 1954, he got married, and later he and his wife Elaine had a son, Philip. Things were not as normal as they seemed, though. In 1955, he attempted to abduct a 36-year-old woman. However, she escaped before he could drive away with her. Seems police got involved, but the woman decided in the end not to press charges, a decision that might have cost quite a few people their lives. Now we move to June 1, 1956, where 18-year-old Mary Fellers and 16-year-old Shelby Venable are looking for a good time. These two youngsters are rebels without a cause. They love hitchhiking, looking for music and fun, much to their parents' concern. This is an era of beat writing and jazz music. The girls don't want to be tied down, they want to discover America, like the author Jack Kerouac. That night, they were waiting at a bus stop with the intention of heading to North Laurel in Maryland when a blue sedan pulled up. The girls got in the car as if they knew the man. They then got out again to switch positions. They seemed very comfortable with the guy, a cool cat with a cute face who impressed young women with his deep talk about philosophy. It wasn't until June 14th that Shelby's body was found face down on a patch of water at a place called Catoctin Creek in Virginia. Mary's body was found nearby. Both girls had died at the same time or thereabouts. Shelby had been strangled and Mary's cause of death was never ascertained. It was later discovered that the girls had been a little bit too obsessed with a handsome jazz player at a club. His name was Melvin Reese. He was indeed a cool cat. That year, 16-year-old Nancy Shomet and her buddy, 14-year-old Michael Ryan, went missing. The two had taken a shortcut through the University of Maryland as they wanted to pick up Nancy's report card from the school. They never got there. Their bodies were found later by a dog walker. They'd been shot by a 22 rifle. In both these cases, pathologists said it didn't look like the killer had been sexually motivated. The victims were young and without known enemies. So, wondered the cops, why had they been murdered in cold blood? It didn't really make much sense. And in those days in Maryland, this kind of thing was not common. The golden age of serial killing in the US was only just starting. This was one of the cases that kicked it off. Now, we must go forward in time to June 26, 1957, when 36-year-old Margaret Harold and 31-year-old Roy Hudson had turned down a small country lane off Maryland's Defense Highway after having some food and beers earlier. They notice a car, after which a man walks toward their car. He tells them, what do you think this is, a national park? The man said it was his job to watch over the area. He then asked the couple for a smoke and asked them if they could give him a ride. When the man got in the car, Roy shuffled to the back, after which the mysterious, well-spoken, handsome man pulled out a snub-nosed steel revolver. The man was about to tie their hands when Roy told him he would not be able to get his cash if his hands were tied. The man replied, don't worry, I'll get your money. Boom. He then shot Margaret in the back of the head, and she slumped over. Roy, seeing an opportunity, burst through the car door and started running for his life. He got to a farmhouse and called the police. When cops got to the car, Margaret's brain matter was splattered everywhere. The man who killed her, described as about 35, white, 6 foot, 170 pounds, had violated her dead body, a pure sicko. Roy then told them that he'd seen a green car parked nearby, which might have belonged to the killer. The car was near a shack, said Roy, and when the cops crept up to that shack, they found some cord lying around. Worse, when they entered the rundown, dirty abode, they were greeted by something out of a nightmare. The walls were covered in photos, horrid photos of autopsies and women tied up, scenes of death and torture taken from what seemed like true detective magazines confronted these cops. This was the 1950s, they really didn't know what to think. We'll just say here that there were many serial killers in the US in the 50s, 60s, and 70s who admitted after being caught they were avid readers of detective magazines, magazines that often depicted murder and cannibalism. They were a huge craze back then, in an era that had just gone through a world war and was involved in a paranoid and violent cold war. Back to the scene, police then noticed another photo. This time, it was a regular photo of a girl who looked high school age. This was just as shocking to them. 
Vronsky describes the scene as police walking into a pervert's lair. Now, dear viewers, we think you can understand what kind of things in the past inspired numerous Hollywood movies. Any number of films have depicted what these cops saw that day. Actually, the rest of the story you've seen presented in Hollywood thrillers time and time again. Not long after this grisly and frankly weird find, a couple, Erwin Adams and Denise Eggleston, walked into the police station looking like they were in shock. They said they'd just been parked in a quiet area when a guy came up to their car and threatened them with a 39 blue steel, snub-nosed gun. The man managed to tie them up partly, but both escaped on foot, barefoot. The man gave chase, but they managed to outrun him. It was around this time that police found the high school girl in a photo of the pervert's lair. Her name was Wanda Tipton. They half expected her to be dead, but she was alive and well. They asked if she'd ever met any strange men, to which she said no. She was lying, she'd been dating this super cool cat, a philosopher, a jazz player intellectual. But she was married, so she told the police she met no one, so as to not get Reese in any trouble. Soon after, another couple in a car met a man with a gun. That man stuffed the male into the trunk and tied the woman up. When he was done with her, he told her, you're a good woman, I'm glad this wasn't worse than it was. She was in shock, she didn't know what to say out of fear for her life. The man allowed them to run off into the nearby woods. On Saturday, January 11, 1959, 29-year-old Carol Jackson, his wife Mildred, and their daughters Susan, 5, and Janet, 18 months, all went missing after visiting Mildred's parents in Louisa, Virginia. Their car was found about 10 miles away on the side of the road, the keys still in the ignition. Soon, newspapers were all over the story talking about a whole family disappearing into thin air. Some talked UFOs and others mentioned witchcraft. Entire families don't just vanish. The next March, two farmers were driving when their truck got stuck in the mud. When one of them went to put branches under the tires, he noticed a shoe, and then an ankle, and then a leg. It was Carol. Police found that he'd been beaten badly around the face and shot through the head. The youngest daughter was found next to him. It was likely she'd been in his arms when he was shot, and so he'd suffocated her when he fell into the mud. But where were the others? Later in March, two teenage boys, John and Patty, were playing with their BB guns close to that pervert's lair in Maryland when they thought they saw the hair of an animal, maybe a squirrel. They shot at it only to realize this was no animal. They walked up to it and poked it. One of the boys later told the police, I thought it was a baby doll, then I saw it was a human. Cops gave this man the name The Beast. He'd done terrible things to the mother, beaten her so badly her lungs packed in. He also beat the girl to death. Not only that, he committed disgusting necrophilic acts with the corpse. What kind of maniac would do such a thing? One of the reasons we're telling you this story is that the Sex Beast is a historical true crime tale because it was the first time the FBI were called in to investigate a serial killer. Up until then, they'd had no interest in such cases, according to Vronsky, who cited Robert Ressler. Still, it seems the FBI was no better than the police forces in Maryland and Virginia at solving the case. It was plain good luck when they got a lead on Reese. They spoke to his roommate, who'd contacted them, and told him his buddy had some very weird ways of looking at life. He told them that Reese, now divorced, a brilliant musician, was fascinated with existential philosophy. The roommate said Reese often told him that existential theory was that there are individual standards of right or wrong. So in some ways, you can make up your own ethics. You can't say it's wrong to kill, he told the roommate. Reese seemed to be expressing the Nietzschean thing about master morality and slave morality. The masters, according to Nietzsche, make their own morals and the slaves follow. The slaves, Nietzsche said, resent the masters and that creates problems in society. What Nietzsche didn't say is that it's okay to kill, but that's how Reese and also Adolf Hitler interpreted the precept. The roommate also said about Reese, anything he reads he likes to experience. He's a thrill seeker, I guess. Reese's mother later said her son would often talk about violence just being a form of self-expression, and no one had the right to take that away from a person. She made him sound like the killer from the movie Seven, saying that he'd often tell her some people in today's sick society shouldn't have the right to live. There are some things I find pleasure in doing, he told his disturbed mother. She later told the police he cheated at games, the trait of a psychopath. She said he was fascinated by not just the murders in detective magazines, but he loved reading about Nazi atrocities. He liked Nietzsche, but held to the views of the anti-naturalist Arthur Schopenhauer, whose philosophy kinda said life was so painful that it's not even worth being born. She said her son would stay up all night on illegal substances reading books written by these people and worse, he was obsessed with the writings of the original sadist, the Marquis de Sade. On June 20, 1960, police arrested him, a man they said was smart and mild-mannered. According to Vronsky, there are varying stories about Reese's childhood. 
but it seems he was a good kid who liked animals. He was clever and well-liked. His father said his son was always kind and sympathetic and could not hurt any living thing. Apparently, Melvin's own son absolutely adored him. After his arrest, his fellow students came out of the woodwork, calling Reese talented, versatile, mild-mannered, intelligent, and friendly. Even his ex-wife said he was all those things, plus he never lifted a finger to her and wasn't into any strange sexual stuff. He was a good husband, she said, but he left her. The B-movie actress and topless dancer Pat Barrington, who'd starred in such movies as Orgy of the Dead, The Satanist, and Hedonistic Pleasures, had also dated and lived with Reese, and it seems they got along just fine. But when the police raided his house, part of the evidence they found was his death diary. In it, he wrote such things as drove to the select area and killed the father and baby. Now the mother were all mine. He emphasized the all mine part. Police refused to make public what he'd done to them as it was too gory, too disgusting. But they did publish the part where he wrote, led her to a place of execution and hung her. I was her master. This is why we've chosen this story. It is mind-boggling how such a clean-cut, well-liked, obviously intelligent man with no history of trauma or violence could become such a maniac. This was a Jekyll and Hyde case like no other. Such killers throughout history are very, very rare. At trial, he looked like a Hollywood movie star and sounded like an intellectual. But in prison, he began to lose his mind. In 1985, he gave an interview to a journalist working for the Richmond Times-Dispatch and admitted to killing Mary Fellers and Shelby Venables. Although he denied killing Ryan and Shemette, he died from heart issues in 1995 while serving time in a federal facility in Missouri. Now you need to watch worst serial killers that cops never caught, or have a look at how these sneaky serial killers finally got caught.